So thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to welcome all of you again to our fourth rendition of our Safe Neurosurgery Initiative, focusing on brain tumor surgery, brought to you by the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Pretoria. I would like to thank and acknowledge for this webinar uh, support from Diesel Life Sciences and from Europa Organization Africa, specifically Yoshni and Claire for their incredible logistic support. So this session will focus on the relevant neurophysiological monitoring and pathways in the brain as they relate to brain tumor surgery. So a special welcome briefly to our faculty, Mrs. Sonia Nunez, Professor Natalie Foots, and Professor Francesco Sala, our local hosts, Ms. Annika van der, Mrs. Annika van der Merwe, myself, and Dr. Asanke Masri. So I'll start the session off now by introducing our first speaker, and I want us to move on. We're going to try and adhere quite strictly to time. So Mrs. Annika van der Merwe is the head of department of neurophysiology at the University of Pretoria, Steve Biko Academic Hospital. She has tremendous experience in neurophysiological monitoring, both in adults and children. And in her recent tenure as HOD, has already made significant improvements uh, in the quality of the unit, unit, both in staffing and quality of staff, which is a startling example of how transdisciplinary teamwork can serve to build a sustainable unit within an academic environment. So Annika, if you want to please uh, start your talk. Thank you very much. Just a reminder to unmute yourself, Annika. Can you, can you see my slideshow? Am I up and running there? There we go. You're can you hear run. me? We can hear you. Yeah, just click on presentation mode and you're good to go. Great. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I'm going to give a short introduction on the sensory evoke potentials that we do in our unit. Uh, the visual, brainstem, and somatosensory evoke potentials of the median and posterior tibial nerve. Most evoke potentials we do not do in our unit, but that is of interest in intraoperative monitoring, namely the M wave and the D wave. M wave, also known as a myogenic EMP, for uh, people that do nerve conduction studies, also the compound muscle action potential, although the wave looks differently. Motor evoke potentials are potentials that is recorded over the motor and nerve systems and after. Uh, stimulation, electrical stimulation and magnetic stimulation of the cortex. So motor sensory evoke potentials are potentials recorded from the sensory nerve, uh, also the somatosensory sensory cortex after distal sensory stimulation of the ner sensory nerve. All evoke potentials needs averaging. This waves are usually too small to see, Therefore, uh, in raw data, therefore, averaging is needed after each impulse. You can see here there's no, uh, the impulse is not visible, but um, the signal is not visible in this noise. But after averaging, the signal is uh, averaged out and you can clearly see the signal, which is uh, what is needed for analysis. Uh, the machine has the ability to uh, reject signals uh, that is of too much noise. The signal to noise, uh, the signal averaging improves the signal to noise ratio of the average developed potential waveform by the factor equal to the square root of the number of trial sweeps included in the average. If your evoke potential data is noisy or the evoke potential amplitudes are too small, the number of averages may have to be increased, like in the example on the right side. Uh, after 32 averages, there's multiple peaks. It's difficult to identify your peaks. But after 2,000 averages, you can clearly see a peak 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. If your, average, your signal to noise average is favorable, then you don't need to do as many averages like you can see in this case, after 40 averages, a clear signal is visible. I have included this uh, slide to show you that during intraoperative monitoring, a lot of noise can be encountered. Your machine's ability to reject an, a noise uh, from, from your average will be able to reject these noise levels recorded from channel two and three here. 
Um, but uh, fortunately, the Cavitron ultrasonic surgical aspiration is, uh, uh, has very low amplitude, fast frequencies activity that will be included in your average if you do not pause your average Therefore, it is important to take note of this because this, will, this can alter your response. Visual evoked potentials are elicited when the patient is focusing on the center of a checkerboard pattern that is altered. Electrodes, are, uh, the signals are picked up from the OZ, uh, mid-occipital, uh, mid the left and the right occipital electrodes, O1 and O2. This impulse actually travels from the retina right through to the primary, primary visual cortex. And that's why it's been um, picked up from the back of the cortex. The wave of interest is your P100 wave. We record four channels, but the P100 wave, the P stands for positive. In this case, upward deflection is positive. The 100 means a control group of uh, normal subjects and have a latency of 100. This value will then be evaluated by normative data. Normative data has to be um, collected to be able to evaluate if this waveform is normal or not. If but you have to make sure that the proceedings and the protocol that you follow is exactly the same that you've done with your data. Therefore, in our unit, latencies are the most important one because amplitude is easily affected by um, defocusing or drowsiness. In intraoperative monitoring, you do not sit with defocusing or drowsiness, but therefore the um, the waves are quite stable. Um, the way the amplitude is therefore used to um, see if, whether it's um, if there's any change happening. There are factors like uh, body temperature and anesthesia that can alter the amplitude. Therefore, then the baseline should be then re-evaluated. So baseline before your um, intraoperative monitoring is very important. Patients that are referred for visual evoke potentials are op op patients with optic neuritis or patients with multiple sclerosis. Um, here you can see uh, optic neuritis, the P100 is prolonged and the duration of the wave is also prolonged. Brainstem auditory evoke potentials are recorded in our unit on the ipsilateral earlobes referred to the CZ electrode. But in intraoperative monitoring, you can use needle electrodes placed on the mastoid and then the inserts, ear inserts, um, stimulate, um, uh, give a click impulse of 2000 to 4000 hertz, which uh, the tip actually has got a very soft foam that you can squash. It can be inserted in the outer ear channel and then it can swell and uh, seal off the ear uh, channel so that external noise is excluded. The impulse travels from the cochlea to the cochlea, through the cochlear nerve to the nucleus and then to the lateral lemniscus before the lateral lemniscus, the superior olive, and then from there to the inferior colliculi and uh, to the auditory, uh, secondary auditory cortex, which is situated there. Multiple peaks are recorded with the auditory evoke potential, the short latency, also known as the ABR, the middle latency, and the long latency. We use the short latency responses. In intraoperative, they also use the short latency responses, but in intraoperative, um, it's, uh, it's better to use a 15 millisecond display. Sonia will, will help me correct me there if I'm incorrect, um, because the P100, uh, the V, uh, peak five, you do not want to miss. The middle latency and long latency responses are often affected by um, anesthesia. Uh, peaks of interest is peak one, three, and five. They are the most persistent. Interpeak latencies are used for diagnostic uh, purposes. Axel is uh, the word you can remember to try and remember where all the waves are elicited. So it's a cochlear nerve, the superior olive, the um, uh, superior olive, sorry, um, acoustic nerve, cochlear nerve, uh, superior olive, inferior colliculi, and lateral lemniscus. Pick four and five is always uh, quite 
it's close to each other and recorded as a 4-5 complex because they are quite closely generated. The patients that are referred to us as usually babies, they want to test their thresholds. So we use PIC-5 to just check their thresholds. PIC-5 has the lowest um, threshold because as it stays longer, it uh, displaces longer as you go in down intensity. A uh, typical example in um, uh, intraoperative, perhaps, uh, acoustic neuroma, which can compress the cochlear nerve and vestibular nerve. Um, pick one can be spared, but pick two and three, you can see is low in amplitude, four and five is prolonged, or even um, the peaks can be abolished after pick one or after pick two. Somatosensory evoked potentials are recorded on the ipsilateral, uh, sorry, the ERPS point, uh, the cervical vertebra number two, four, which is usually placed four centimeters down the inion, and the contralateral electrode C3 prime. Prime means two centimeters be behind the true C3 electrode. N9 is recorded from the ERPS point. Uh, it's usually a very high response. Um, higher than the N13 and the N20 recorded from the neck and the cortex. Uh, posterior tibial um, electrodes are placed, can be placed and behind the popliteal fossa to record the N8. We record the nimble response, the N22, at the L3 electrode position, referred to an electrode placed three, 10 centimeters above L3, and then the P38, um, which is recorded from the CZ prime position uh, on the somatosensory cortex. Emotor evoked potentials, uh, the, potential, the M wave is of interest there, and the M, uh, it actually records muscle activity from several uh, muscles, depending on which nerve you want to test. The D wave is uh, recorded from the spinal cord. It can be recorded either by epidural um, needles or subdural electrodes that is placed at the spinal cord. Now the D wave is of interest is uh, because if the amplitude of the D wave drops from 30 to 50% and the M wave is stable, then it's normal. Um, there won't be a problem. If the D wave um, uh, lowers in amplitude 30 to 50% in amplitude, but the M wave is lost, then there might be a transient deficit. If, however, if the D wave drops in amplitude more by 50% and your MEP is lost, your M wave is lost, then uh, it can indicate permanent deficit. Um, the difference between somatosensory and, and motor evoked potentials, you can see that the red wires are the uh, um, usually uh, for sensory evoked potentials, uh, stimulated, stimulating the um, posterior tibial nerve. You can stimulate the common peroneal nerve or even the radial nerve in intraoperative monitoring. And then the electrodes that record, is recorded at the neck and also the sensory cortex. But with motor evoked potentials, you actually stimulate with transcranial stimulator at the C3, uh, C2 and C1 electrode. Um, but the recordings are then made um, with a D wave behind the neck and also the muscles, different muscle activity. The um, somatosensory evoked potentials actually test the posterior part of the uh, spinal cord through the dorsal column, where the uh, motor evoked potentials actually test the anterior part more, and it's a more a descending um, wave. Thank you. I also want to thank Professor Peter Bartel and Elna Janssen van Rensburg for their dedication in the neurophysiology field. And Sonia also for your dedication in intraoperative monitoring. I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annika. That was a wonderful overview on, on the services provided in basic um, neurophysiology. So thanks so much for sticking to time and for giving us such a great overview. Uh, we're going to save discussion and questions for the, uh, for the end. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Professor Natalie Foots. So Natalie is Associate Professor, Research Fellow, and Principal Investigator at the Wellcome Center for Integrative Neuroimaging, 
or as I know it, the FIMRIB in the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences at Oxford University, which is easily one of the world's leading neuroscience units. So Natalie completed her DPhil on temporal lobe ep epilepsy under the mentorship of Professor Paul Matthews, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship under Oxford's world-renowned Professor Tipo Aziz, expanding her, her and our insights on brain plasticity. So she's published extensively on neural networks and pathways, carving a name for herself as a respected neuroscientist in this fiercely competitive academic environment, where I was fortunate enough to get to know Natalie during my, my academic scholarship at Oxford. So it's a tremendous pleasure to introduce Natalie and invite her to give us some insight into the white matter pathways of the brain. Thanks, Nat. Thank you. Let me just start that for you then. Hopefully you can see my slides now. Yep. Perfect. Sure. So thank you for the invitation and the fantastic introduction. I'll aim uh, to provide a short overview of the white matter fiber tracts as they are relevant to neurosurgery for brain tumors and how we can image those non-invasively with MRI. That is quite a feat for 20 minutes. So I will attempt to give basic principles of why we should care about white matter tracts how we can measure them in vivo in individual patients, which tracts we would be most concerned about in the individual patient, and a couple of case illustrations just to keep it surgically relevant. Those who know about the history of neuroscience will recognize this brain as belonging to Broca's famous patient who lost the ability to speak following this lesion in the posterior inferior frontal cortex. What is less well recognized is that this lesion actually also implicated quite a lot of the underlying white matter, and it is now well recognized that even in the absence of cortical deficits, substantial neurological conditions can arise even from uh, damage to the underlying long range white matters, uh, white matter connections. So these long range axonal connections actually form up just the minority of all white matter, but are now recognized to form really essential contributions to not just speech and movement, but a large range of behaviors, including memory, attention, higher cognition, and so forth. This functional relevance is really illustrated very nicely here in this paper from a European group of glioma neurosurgeons that demonstrated and plotted the areas where they had to stop surgery based on intraoperative observations of deficits from stimulation. And the key thing here is that most often those deficits did not arise or those um, surgical targets margins did not arise in the cortex, not even Broca's area, but rather mostly in the underlying white matter. And this is thought to be because the cortex can actually exhibit some neuroplasticity, whereas the white matter seems to be rather unforgiving of damage. What does that mean for an individual patient? So here I show, for example, three cases of gliomas that are located a little bit more in the subcortical areas. Would these be operable? Should we send them to chemo radiotherapy or even just best supportive care? Well, we'll come back to that because the answer really lies in their individual anatomy and the relationship between their lesion and important fiber tracts. How can we dis determine this? Most of our anatomy, obviously, from white matter comes from dissections, classical dissections such as this Klingler prepared brain showing the white matter connections and has emerged in the 1970s with retrograde and interrograde tracers, and more recently, the fantastic, exciting new imaging, optical imaging and post-mortem imaging approaches. Difficulty is these are all a little bit late for us in our clinical decision-making, of course, because they require access to an explanted brain, therefore not quite what we want. So this is where an imaging technique based on diffusion MRI really comes into play, noting that it's really been in the last 15 years or so that the acquisition and analysis methods have developed that enable us to measure these long range fiber tracts in vivo individual brain. How does this work? Just a basic little introduction to the principles because those are also the main limitation is that we take advantage of the abundance of water in the brain to be able to generate contrast without the need for an injected contrast agent. What this really is based on is measuring diffusion of water molecules. Therefore, I will emphasize several times that this is an indirect measure. But why is it interesting? It is interesting because the random dispersion of water molecules in the brain is not actually altogether random and is informed by the tissue microstructure surrounding it, such that water molecules in the CSF, for example, are relatively unhindered in their ability to diffuse until they reach the ventricle wall. 
But instead, if we look at a cross section of an axon here, then diffusion of water molecules will be restricted across the axon. If we look at the same neuron, then we appreciate that diffusion will be preferential along the long axis and restricted across its cross section. What we do with MRI is essentially just measure water diffusion at many directions surrounding the brain at multiple time points. The concept being that if water molecules have not moved in the time that we've measured, the signal should be the same. Whereas if they have moved, we'll lose signal, such as is apparent here by just looking at the raw data in the sagittal stratum. From these kind of metrics, we can derive a map that shows us how much is diffusion restricted at every location in the brain and plot out which direction is it restricted in, providing these red, green, blue maps where blue is up, down, red is between the hemispheres and green is anterior to posterior. I take a moment to show you these because these are what you will normally see in your neuro navigation software to generate these tracks. From that information, it is then a straightforward next step to simply follow the dots and trace either connectivity across the whole brain or to focus in on a specific anatomical pathway of interest, such as the IFOF here, which shows really remarkably deceptive comparison to the dissection anatomy also in the optic radiations. Before delving into each and every one of these tracts and showing why we should care about them, just a side note about some important pathological confounds that arrive, arise particularly in tumor populations. I will not touch on the importance of sequence acquisition and analysis because that can do a separate talk altogether, but a common confound we observe in tumor patients in particular is edema. This is apparent very frequent around metastases, but also high-grade gliomas, sometimes meningiomas, where a lot of this um, excess fluid buildup can cause substantial difficulties for diffusion technique in generating fiber directionality, just we're too uncertain to make an estimate. Here you see in our standard neuronavigation suite that due to the amount of edema, it was impossible to generate with any reliability any uh, corticospinal tract fibers, even though we knew they should be totally present because the patient was unimpaired. In this context, fortunately, with a more advanced analysis approach, we were able to generate where those were. However, it's just to re-emphasize, we're not measuring anatomy here. And so it is important in the context of edema not to misinterpret an empty map as indicating that there are no nearby fibers. This occurs also with bleeds, I should say. The second common problem we encounter as our neurosurgical approaches become increasingly good at controlling recurrence and, and tumor growth is redo operations, where in this patient we see both the problem of previous metallic clips causing signal artifact, but also previous radiotherapy and tumor regrowth confounding a little bit our signal. We were able to generate here the corticospinal tract, but we also identify a few other potentially spurious connections that are not necessarily anatomically true. How, what can we do then if these problems arise? Well, if it is possible to do uh, diffusion tractography and advanced acquisitions are not available, one popular technique is instead to use functional MRI in order to identify the cortical areas where speech, movement, or vision are located in order to generate the connections that go there. For those not super familiar with functional MRI, it is another non-invasive um, MRI technique, but in this case, we ask the patient in the scanner to perform a task as instructed here to think words such as fruits for 30 seconds or not to do anything at all so that we can generate activation maps of where oxygen goes in the blood to generate in this left-handed patient with a right frontal glioma a map showing the language sites being quite close to that unexpectedly and here a second case where the central sulcus is effaced by a glioma to identify the hand motor cortical regions and this is the approach for example that I used in the previous case where I was able to generate the corticospinal tract despite those confounds by using functional MRI. With those two techniques combined then, the promise is that we can move towards personalized treatment decision-making for strategic approaches to tumors. Of course, from these maps, you'll have seen there are fiber connections everywhere. So if we were to worry about each and every one of them, we would never start or attempt neurosurgical resection of brain tumors. Let me therefore highlight a few that we have lots of evidence, both from neurosurgery and intraoperative mapping of the ability to preserve those. I'll focus on the optic radiations that you already previously saw, the corticospinal tract fibers, 
and a number of important speech and language related tracts. The optic radiations have already been shown in the previous talk, but this is just to highlight that there are three predominant bundles that link the lateral geniculate nucleus to the calcarine fissure with different concerns for neurosurgical intervention. The first being the anterior or Mayer's loop, where the clinical problem is that the anterior extent of those varies widely between subjects and therefore no anatomical um, landmarks, even relative to the temporal horn, can tell us what will be the distance in order to preserve quadrantinopia. This applies to anterior temporal lobectomy approaches in particular. There's also a central bundle shown in yellow, which goes to the occipital pole and the posterior fibers that connect directly into the superior lip of the calcarine fissure. And these become of greatest concern for lateral posterior, posterior approaches, usually to a tumor. As already highlighted in the previous talk, the, so the clinical problems that arise with damage to any portions of these fibers depends on where the injury occurs, resulting in quadrantinopias or hemianopias. And in this context, diffusion tractography-based reconstruction of parts of the optic radiation have proven themselves already very helpful, particularly for temporalobectomies, where identifying and visualizing the optic radiations in tractography shown in purple here down the surgical microscope has been shown to reduce both the severity and the incidence of quadrantinopias following surgery, in this case, usually temporal lobe epilepsy. The corticospinal tract will not be any surprise to this audience, so I will not highlight anything that you don't already know, except to highlight just the variability that it is not just the precentral BET cells, but also some postcentral that give rise to this. And the real clinical concern is that in the posterior part of the internal capsule, there is debate and inter individual variability as to exactly where the location of these tracts are as they proceed down to the midbrain, midbrain um, brainstem and spinal cord. In this context, again, corticospinal fiber reconstruction with tractography has proven that it shows the highest agreement of all the tracts with other stimulation techniques and monitoring techniques with a randomized controlled trial, the only one that I'm aware of at least, showing that visualizing the tracts intraoperatively helps with improving maximal safe resection for gliomas, including resulting in larger resection extents and therefore greater survival in the high-grade group, but also fewer deficits in general. And I demonstrate this, for example, here, even if the patient is operated asleep, we were able to preserve entirely that corticospinal tract. Speech and language are much more complex uh, in terms of the nature of what pathways sustain them. The majority of speech production is associated with components of the superior longitudinal fasciculus, where again, there are multiple compartments, including the arcuate, which is the classically associated pathway linking the frontal to temporal lobe very medially. Just lateral to it is the horizontal segment, also called SLF3, which links the ventral precentral gyrus with the supramarginal gyrus and potentially parts of the posterior superior temporal gyrus. And very crucially, also connections called the temporal parietal or vertical segment that link the posterior temporal lobe with the angular gyrus. Why do we need to know this? Well, because of the complexity of this anatomy, all of these are a little bit still disputed as to exactly what they contribute, but it is thought that the arcuate contributes to phonemic aspects of speech. So the form of the word will come out wrong if you stimulate it. Sometimes you see repetition as well. For SNF3, it is more the motor articulation aspects of speech that come into play. So you will stop the ability to speak by stimulating it. And these vertical segments are a bit more complex, but most likely contribute to comprehension, but also possibly parts of reading and writing. A really elegant study has actually demonstrated that patients following glioma surgery who still had speech errors three months on, what we would classically call permanent, had damage specifically either to the arcuate or to this temporal parietal connection, demonstrating the importance of carefully preserving those. I mentioned reading. Most classically, of course, that's associated with the visual word form area, which is thought to be supported by the inferior longitudinal fasciculus as it goes from the temporal pole to the occipital and fusiform gyri. 
The role of this is a little bit more disputed because there are lots of U fibers thought to support potentially more of the behaviors such that removing the anterior portions is less frequently associated with deficits than you would expect. But posteriorly, it's very unforgiving. And in the dominant hemisphere, you most likely will see patients unable to read. And in the non-dominant hemisphere, there's probably deficits associated with object or face recognition. Face recognition could also be due to another pathway running very nearby, and this is called the IFOF, inferior frontal occipital fasciculus. One of the most fascinating because actually it was rediscovered, as it were, through diffusion tractography, which very reliably always identifies this pathway, linking the prefrontal cortex to the occipital cortex. It's not reported in anterograde and retrograde tracing studies, but that's of course because most of those are done in the primate, where this pathway is not generally seen, but dissection studies have since confirmed its existence. You will find that the cortical terminations are still not super clear, but you will definitely see the origins in the anterior external capsule, either side of the claustrum, as it runs through the superior two thirds of the temporal stem, just above the uncinate. At the level of the middle temporal gyrus, it is situated just laterally to the optic radiations, but medial to those of the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. What does it do? There's not much evidence of having dissected this out in surgery accidentally, but stimulating it causes semantic errors. So showing somebody an orange and they might call it a pear. Highlighting that in this posterior inferior parietal occipital cortex, we end up having this hot spot where all these fibers come together, making this one of the most difficult to operate. Those who are following the literature will know that there is increasing interest in tracts that support neglect and that supports supplementary motor area deficits and higher cognition. It's still a little bit, the jury is out as to what that is, but probably the junction between SLF2 and 3 supports neglect, whereas the frontal Aslan tract is implicated in SMA syndrome and corticostriatal fibers, fibers probably in higher cognition. That's great, I've shown you lots of pictures. How do we use it? Well, here you see we actually intraoperatively visualize with our system here in the context of an, an endoscopic approach, but also when sometimes fused to an ultrasound approach to inform the risks of surgery and the consent of patient, decide the treatment strategy, whether this should be biopsy, resection, endoscopic, predictive for resection, how to go about this, where and when to focus awake stimulation, and if we can't do awake surgery, well, how we can minimize those approaches. How do we do that? In the same way as you'll hear a little bit later, we perform a lot of, we, in fact, all of our neuro-oncology patients get tractography now, and we perform intraoperative stimulation under awake conditions as much as possible to monitor the tracts according to the expected behavior. So very quick whirlwind tour then of those initial three cases. The first one I showed you was a 51-year-old who came in, PR executive could no longer understand um, the subtitles on something he was watching, ended up in our MRI diagnosed with what appeared to be a GBM. He wanted a complete resection as much as possible because he had two young sons. So his main quality of life, however, desire was to be able to return to playing his band. So we mapped out areas to do with speech, word reading and music sheet reading, as well as the connections that support those functions performed awake surgery to achieve a very good resection with just a little bit residual where we identified some speech and optic related errors. The second case, somewhat similar location in that hotspot, 55 year old with visual symptoms while acting as a diving instructor. So we measured out speech, this being in the left hemisphere and vision, as well as all the tracks, because of course the favorite approach would be laterally here through the temporal lobe, but that would cut through important fibers. So we took a more superior medial approach to achieve again a very good resection, leaving just a little bit here in the medial um, um, parietal lobe, but preserving all the fiber tracts, as you can see here from the pre and post comparison. And then the third one, perhaps the most challenging, a 26 year old admitted to our emergency department in status. We performed tractography to identify where the corticospinal tract was in order to approach this if possible. Fortunately, the fibers were pushed anteromedially, enabling an endoscopic approach with a very good resection, patient was able to walk home out of the hospital themselves. And that compares instead to a different case here where the corticospinal fibers were pushed laterally and we had to take a more anterior approach. 
with that said, I hope that I have, oops, I've lost my mouse. I hope that I have uh, persuaded you of the important critical contribution made by White Matter Tracts, that diffusion tractography offers us tool to measure these in vivo in the individual, although it is indirect and susceptible to pathological confounds, particularly bleeds, edema, and prior surgical considerations. It nonetheless often offers a powerful adjunct to see the relationship of a lesion to functions for speech, language, vision, and sensory motor functions in particular. In our hands, we use this intraoperatively for each and every oncological case to complement our surgical decision-making and planning. With that, it's just to thank you and my surgical colleagues at the University of Oxford. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. That was just a fantastic overview, uh, underscoring the importance, I think, mostly of understanding and meta-me before any of the, the, the kind of adjuncts become useful at all. So thanks very much. That was just Thank fantastic. You. We're going to save, and, and apologies from our side for the, for the disruption with the sound. Can I just remind everyone to please mute yourself? And Claire, just be ruthless with the, with the mute button if people don't mute themselves. Okay, with that, we're going to move on swiftly um, just to keep to time and we'll have discussion afterwards. Our next speaker is Mrs. Sonia Nunez. Just a quick check with, with Francesco Sala. Francesco, are you still okay for us to go ahead with this talk and you follow? Yep, thanks. Okay, great, thanks. All right, so Mr. Sonia Nunes yeah, did an undergraduate training in neurophysiology at the University of Pretoria. She then underwent further training in intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring under the mentorship of Professor Sala at the prestigious Institute of Neurosurgery in Verona. She then returned to South Africa, went to Cape Town, did a further year of training at the Red Cross Children's Hospital, Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital, before venturing out into private practice, where she quickly evolved into a highly sought-after IONM technician on the Cape Town circuit. So it's a real personal pleasure to welcome Sonia to give us a talk on what she thinks the neurosurgeon needs to know about intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Padiachi, for uh, having invited me. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm just going to try and shed some light on my personal experiences on what the neurosurgeons need to know about intraoperative monitoring. Right. What is intraoperative monitoring and how does it work? Well, it's a multidisciplinary team that consists of the neurosurgeon, your anesthetist, your neurophysiologist. And if you're lucky in South Africa, you'll have a neuropsychologist that will assist in awake surgeries. There are specific anesthetic protocols. Um, all IOM surgeries have these protocols. Um, we are unable to use general anesthetics such as neuromuscular blockades um, and obviously volatile agents as those suppress the potentials. So uh, we will, I will discuss that in the next slide what the recommended um, agents are. Uh, multiple modalities are tailored to the patient's neurological picture and surgery. So we have specific modalities that we use post-surgery um, and this needs to be discussed with the surgeon prior to each case so that we have an idea exactly what it is the surgeon aims to achieve, what the uh, neurological picture of the patient is and how best to serve the patient and the surgeon. And um, these protocols um, can be quite um, time intensive. And then there are obviously some contraindications to consider. Uh, patients with pacemakers, uh, we are unable to perform an interoperative monitoring on them and patients who are pregnant. Anesthetic protocol, propofol and remifentanil. Um, those are the two anesthetic um, agents that we use um, as they don't block any of the potentials. Mean blood pressure needs to be between 80 and 90. This is to allow for good perfusion and to avoid any ischemic events. Um, and body temperature between 34 and 36. Um, this just helps us to make sure that if there is a call that we need to make when we are reporting on the interpretive monitoring, that we can exclude any anesthetic and systemic issues from the anesthetic team. Select muscle groups are required for monitoring. Um, each type of surgery has their own specific muscle groups. For supratentorial, we um, focus mainly on the upper and lower limbs. Sometimes, depending on where the lesion is, we might have a control for the facial, but then again, always discuss this with your surgeon because you'll need to, it's, it's um, predominantly based on lesion. Select muscle groups. Um, the general protocols are specific to the abductor pollis brevis, 
you will also have another control extensor uh, digitum brevis um, can go higher up if necessary. And then lower limbs will concentrate on quadriceps anter um, anterior tibial and abductor hallucis. You will have SCPs. For upper limbs, you focus either on the median or the ulnar nerve. And then for the lower limbs, you'll focus on the anterior tibial. And then you will always have a control. Um, if the lesion is on the right side, then you'll obviously focus um, on the limbs on the left and your right-sided limbs will then be your control. Okay. This is an illustration to show you how we place the corkscrews. Um, I often get some comical remarks from my surgeons on how do I place the corkscrews? Is it just randomly placed? No. <laughs> so this is a lovely illustration. It's based on the International 1020 system, like we place with the um, EEGs. I'm not going to go into too much detail on the 10-20-10% system. What I'd like you to focus on is this uh, annotation um, here in red. These are the motor placements. Often you'll see when I call out, we're talking about the dipoles. So you have the C3, C4, C1, C2. If we have to focus on the legs, then we'll also do the CZ. FZ dipole, um, that is predominantly focused on the motor cortex. Um, and then C3, C4, CZ, FZ focuses on the somatosensory. Um, and I think this is quite a nice illustration just to give you an idea of what it is that we're actually talking about when we say lateral or stimulation and medial stimulation. All right, this is just an illustration to show you how we place the corkscrews. Um, there's something I wanted to point out. Um, for those surgeons who are going to implement intraoperative monitoring into their practices and aren't aware of how this all works, the preparation is quite time consuming. Um, so we generally will arrive at the same time prior to the anesthetist um, and all preparation or placement of the needles is done in supine position because we have to secure the needles. It's very, very difficult to place the needles in lateral or prone position. All right, so what I'm doing here is I've, I've cleaned and marked prior. I didn't do it, um, I didn't record it for, due to time constraints. This is just an illustration to show you what the corkscrews look like. I had already marked prior. Um, they literally screw onto the scalp. Um, and the reason we use these electrodes is because they um, stay on quite nicely. They're nice and secure. Um, remember when we stimulate, there's quite um, an aggressive jump from the patient. Um, these do not dislodge and the impedances are quite low. So they, they stay on right until the end of surgery. Um, I'm just going to fast forward here uh, just so that you can see what they look like. So you'll see these are the motor evokes the running there and then we secure them. Okay, and then this is the other point that I'd like to make. It's very important that your wires are neat and tidy, nicely secured. There is a lot of artifact that um, these head boxes will pick up. Um, and there's multiple modalities that we're doing with when you attach your strip electrode, your bipolar, monopolar probe. And you also want to stay very, very far away from your surgeon and your scrub nurse. You don't want to be interfering with them um, and sticking in probes and so forth. And also obviously, um, causing um, infection or um, interrupting them or um, affecting the sterile field. So neat and tidy away from them um, and making sure that everything is obviously functioning prior to the sterile sheets. All right, this is just an illustration to show you um, the example that I mentioned, abductor hallucis bilaterally and um, then you have the posterior tibial, uh, sorry, the, uh, yes, the posterior tibial for the somatosensories, and we have anterior tibial quadriceps bilaterally for the lower limbs, and we have the abductor hallucis as a control, and then you have the median nerve. We pick the median nerve as the SCP because it's um, the biggest one and often the most reliable. All right. The problem, the biggest, um, challenge that we have when we are doing supratentorial uh, monitoring is often the craniotomy is quite large and often our electrodes are in 
<laughs> are disturbing the surgeon's um, area where they need to make the pronotum. So what we do is we place the electrodes. It's important that we take a baseline prior to the craniotomy because we need to determine what the neurophysiology looks like prior to um, surgery. Um, often patients don't present necessarily with drastic clinical changes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the patient doesn't have any neurophysiological changes. So what we will do is we will place the uh, corkscrews prior to surgery. And this is the same illustration I showed you earlier, just less complicated. Um, and I wanted to sh just show you how we stimulate the uh, transcranial stimulation. So we place the MEPs. For a motor evoked potential, it requires a train. And this is what it, this illustration shows, it requires a train of five in order to elicit a motor evoked potential is what we're getting here. And that is why you have that vigorous jump um, from the patient. When we stimulate the D wave electrode, which is the electrode that goes into the epidural space, you're sending a current from the um, cortex down the cortical spinal tracts. It's a single stimulation uh, and you're picking up the response in the epidural space. You're not getting a jerk in response from the patient. So you're able to continuously average and stimulate this re response throughout surgery while the surgeon is um, debulking uh, the lesion. So this is quite a nice way of um, doing your um, uh, MEPs, uh, your D wave. Unfortunately, that can't be done with your MEPs. So what we do with your supertentorial surgeries is you take your baseline with your MEPs. Often, if, if your lesion, uh, your, craniotomy, your electrodes are in the way of your craniotomy, you will have to remove them. And then we, I will discuss with you what our next little asset is. Okay. But before we get there, all intraoperative um, surgeries will have the standard somatosensory evoked potentials motivo potentials and EMG free running. Okay. For those of you who are not familiar with the EMG, it's not the EMG that we have in clinical, um, in the clinical neurophysiology setting, it's the free running. We can't stimulate that. It's the natural um, nervous system responses. So it, uh, we pick it up um, by the placement from the same placement oil that we uh, place the MEP needles and we are just looking for traction responses or responses of the core tree or so forth. Um, or when we do the mapping responses. Okay, these little ones, the phase reversal, direct cortical stimulation and the ECOG, these all work with the strip electrode. Okay, and these are our, become our biggest asset when we need to remove the corkscrews. And then um, we also use mapping, which I'll leave for Professor Sala to discuss. Okay, right, in the supertentorial lesions, um, our main focus is obviously to try and identify motor cortex. So in the ideal world, this is what our central sulcus would look like. We have our motor cortex over here and the central sulcus would sit here. In the perfect patient in the ideal world. That is not often the case. Right, I've taken this um, image from the ISIN SCP protocol um, and I'm going to explain to you how this works. I'm not sure how many uh, neurosurgeons are familiar with the phase reversal, um, but this is what I'm going to explain to you. So this is a strip electrode. It's an eight, this particular one is an eight contact one. Um, in our practice in South Africa, we also use the eight contact electrode. Um, the reason we chose this one is because if we don't make contact with one or eight, it at least gives us time, um, gives us the benefit of risking those. Um, and I go blind, so I don't know which side faces which way, and then I try and find uh, the phase reversal. My surgeons don't tell me um, until after I found the phase reversal, which side is one, which side is eight. Okay, so what we do is we first place the strip electrode um, over where we think the central sulcus is. Um, but prior to that, we get a SEP um, on the contralateral side through the median nerve, um, through the corkscrews, and we use that as our baseline. Um, this is done before the craniotomy. Once we have that, we place the strip electrode and we move it uh, generally on the side of uh, the location on the hand, um, and we then move the 
the strip until we get a good response. Right, um, in this example, they were able to find a nice response. Uh, this is what a normal SCP looks like. So we use the median nerve to find a normal SCP. And when they find the inverse, all right, um, that's when they, the inverse between those two electrodes is where the central sulcus lies. So in this case, it was between three and four. So the central sulcus lies here. All right, I'm going to show you an example of one that I did. This case was rather um, a tedious one because this patient, <laughs> this lesion had uh, shifted the central sulcus rather uh, posteriorly and we struggled um, to find anatomically, we thought the central sulcus was rather more anteriorly where it should be. But um, in his case, it was rather uh, further posteriorly. So it was a bit of a challenge, but we eventually found it. And here's a nice example. Um, his was between four and five, and you can see it. Okay. Over here, we have an example of what motor evoke potentials look like. Um, this is the left side, this is the right side. Oh, my apologies, sorry. Um, first two channels are the upper limbs, so you always have control, upper and lower limbs. And then these last three channels are the lower limbs. So I just want to show you what they look like. Um, slightly, um, not too much of a difference. We look for when we are analyzing MEPs, we compare right and left side. We look for amplitude. There shouldn't be more than a 50% uh, change in amplitude. Latency, we do look at that, but oh, we look at the overall. So in this case, there is a slight amplitude change, but not significant to call an alarm. However, in this case, it was a completely different picture. Um, this patient, this was a pre-op um, baseline um, that we took. Uh, as you can see, also same, sorry, left side, right side, controls, upper limbs, lower limbs. This patient was presented with weakness pre-op. Um, and so I took the baseline and you can see left side was fine. Obviously lesion was on the left side, presented with uh, weakness on the right and you can see the weakness, uh, lower amplitudes, um, morphology is different. You can see the squiggles for lack of a better um, uh, term to say um, looks different. Okay, um, just gonna run quickly. The strip electrode can also be used for EEG recording. Very, very helpful. Um, sometimes if you're lucky, you're able to do both. In this instance, I was able to do both corkscrews and strip. Very useful when you're looking for um, after discharges. Okay. This is just an example of what an awake setup can look like. If you're lucky, you have an anesthetist. This patient was very cooperative, neuropsychologist and your neurophysiologist constantly monitoring and watching out for any uh, difficult scenarios that may erupt. Okay, so lastly, um, just to touch on some of the monopolar and bipolar stimulators that we have available. Um, this is a bipolar stimulator, not going to get too much detail. That is a uh, monopolar, bipolar uh, stimulation stays between the two uh, points and it's a shorter distance. Uh, monopolar is a bigger stimulation. Just want to show you what the where the strip lies and the corkscrew, how it can be in the way and therefore you need to use your strip electrode to stimulate um, your MEPs because you can't stimulate your MEPs that way. So I'm just going to touch on that. This is um, a diagram from the uh, Journal of Pediatric Neuroscience. They did that here. They stimulated with the, um, the strip electrode, so direct cortical stimulation. <laughs> they were able to get a response from the hand and through the <laughs> So they did the same thing post-op. They were still able to maintain a good response there and are later with the corkscrews. So this is something that we would need to do if we were able to do use the corkscrews um, if we had to remove them for the pre -marching. Lastly, just a tip for the neuro neurophysiologists, bite blocks are essential. Please, please, I cannot stress this enough. Um, 
all patients need a bite block. It is not the responsibility of the nutritionist to put the bite box in um, to protect from lacerations and so forth. Um, you put them in, you take them out. There's um, surgical etiquette. You place the needles, it's your job to remove them, make sure that uh, there are no hematomas and to make sure that um, the patient is um, doing well post-operatively because um, you never know if you have to go back in if there's been a problem. And then again, please check that um, your protocols are correct with the surgeon prior to surgery. Lastly, continuous feedback. We need continuous feedback with your team. Um, your surgeon needs to be fully aware of what's going on throughout surgery and your anesthetist. So in order for IM to be successful, for the surgery to be successful, um, your, your, um, and, sorry, your intraoperative neurophysiologist technologist needs to constantly uh, be informing your uh, neurosurgeon. In the end, your patient is your most important person. Conclusion, IOM is a wonderful and essential adjunct to neurosurgery, requires correct protocols, experienced neurophysiologists are required, and um, something that was pointed out, please just um, take note, IOM techniques for adults do not necessarily apply to pediatrics just something that was brought to our attention. Uh, pediatrics requires slightly different uh, protocols. Right, thank you very, very much. So thank you very much, Sonia, for the lovely, lovely overview and a comprehensive mm -hmm. discussion of what the neurosurgeon needs to know about intraoperative monitoring. So I'd like to thank our first three speakers for really setting a beautiful context for the relevance of this, this webinar. And uh, with that, I'm going to introduce our final speaker, who is uh, Professor Sala. So Francesco Sala is Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of Verona. The main fields of interest are pediatric neurosurgery and intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring. He worked at the prestigious New York Research Institute as research clinical fellow under the renowned Professor Fred Epstein. He was co-founder and later president of the International Society of Intraoperative Neurophysiology. Currently serves on the executive board of the International Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery and the European Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery. He's the Italian delegate for the training committee of the European Association of Neurosurgical Societies. And in 2016, he was the first chair of the Neuromonitoring Committee of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. So Professor Sala is a renowned figure in IONM and pediatric neurosurgery, and it's a personal pleasure to welcome Francesco to give us this talk on neuromonitoring for brain tumors. Thank you, Francesco. I hope you can see my screen now. Can you see it? Yeah. Oh, you're a largely undeserved introduction. Uh, actually, I'm very pleased and honored to uh, participate in this symposium. As some of you may know, South Africa is on my top list for retirement, unless you provide me with a position before that. But joking aside, I've been enjoying my frequent flying to uh, your beautiful country of the past 15 years. Uh, I've been many times to Cape Town at a time when Professor Padiachi was still there. And I take this opportunity also to congratulate him for his uh, academic achievement uh, in Pretoria. So uh, probably most of you know where, where Oxford is. You may not know where Verona is. So just to have an idea, this is where I live and where I work. Actually, I live a little bit off town in what can be considered the Stellenbosch of Verona. We have great wines in our area. And this is the hospital, uh, uh, the university hospital in Verona, not the main attraction. You might decide to come here to see the arena, enjoy the opera festival and the uh, Romeo and Juliet. But if you come to visit us, this is uh, our uh, surgical block at the University Hospital in Verona. So I've been asked to address the uh, topic of uh, um, neuromonitoring guide surgery for brain tumors. And uh, I will focus essentially on the mapping and monitoring of the motor system in a sleep brain tumor surgery. So we'll not uh, very much touch on awake surgery, but I'm happy to take questions uh, if there is any particular uh, interest uh, in the awake mapping. Okay, 
So uh, what have we learned in the surgery of brain gliomas over the past 10, 15 years? Uh, we know nowadays that we should operate on these tumors, the sooner the better. There is no more space for a wait and see policy, especially for leukaric gliomas. We know that tumor resection correlates with survival. This is true for the low grade, but also true for the high grade gliomas. And therefore the mantra over the past several years has been to maximize resection and minimize morbidity. So we know that the survival increased with the extent of resection, but obviously this also correlates with increased risk of neurological deficit. Now, um, I will not touch on the debate between awake and asleep craniotomy. Of course, awake is mandatory when you're testing cognitive function like language. Uh, but for tumors which are confined to cortical and subcortical motor areas, the options are to perform awake surgery, which has the advantage in some cases that you can test not just the cortical spinal tract, but also more sophisticated motor systems that can be challenging to test in the asleep patient. But certainly in asleep surgery is the standard uh, with cortical subcortical motor mapping and NMEP monitoring. And uh, I would say that this is uh, 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 enough safe when the motor system is at risk. Um, so there is no strict need for an awake craniotomy when the tumor is strictly confined to the motor areas. Um, this is an interesting um, survey which was published four years ago uh, involving about 15 European centers who treated about 2,000 patients with brain tumors. You can see that awake surgery was uh, the, cho the selected uh, approach in 40%, but still 60% of the patients were operated in a sleep condition. Now, obviously, when we are facing these tumors, uh, uh, the first question to be asked is how to identify the primary motor cortex. Uh, of course, we can look at the anatomy, we can look at the omega sign, we can look at the uh, cortical uh, um, anatomy. Uh, we have been using fMRI, I would say more often in the past than nowadays. Uh, fMRI has the advantage of providing some functional information. Uh, is based on the bold effect, uh, but of course, this provides what I would consider metabolic imaging, which does not necessarily correspond to the neurophysiological information, uh, especially when you have a phenomenon of uncoupling, uh, like what you can get with the arteriovenous malformation. And the, the other limitation of the fMRI is that it does not provide any information on the subcortical pathways. So fMRI has some role in the um, motor mapping. I would be very reluctant to make any surgical decision based on fMRI for language. Uh, but as was very beautifully addressed by Professor Foetz uh, early on, uh, nowadays the human connectome is leading the way. So there is a, a great interest for the white matter tracts and for the way that different areas of the brain communicate um, and communicate with the spinal cord and the brainstem. Uh, DTI is not perfect. This is the same case addressed by six different groups. And you can see how, uh, depending on how you perform the analysis, you may have different results. Um, so there is now uh, quite some evidence that some of these bundles are uh, invalid bundles. Uh, and these uh, uh, bias, of course, systematically across research groups. So DTI is very useful, but we have, of course, to take it with a grain of salt. Um, a recent technique, which is not recent per se, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation has been in use for many years in neurology, but the so-called navigated TMS is now being used in neurosurgery with uh, uh, some success. We just started to use this technique in the last year or so. Um, this is a, a beautiful uh, tool to perform preoperative functional mapping and in some way also to validate tractography, looking at different spots which are highlighted by the TMS and to see those from where the DTI starts. So TMS may in the future help us to validate which bundles of the tract tractography are more reliable than others. 
but there is no doubt that intraoperative neurophysiology is still nowadays the gold standard when it comes to cortical motor mapping and of course cortical mapping in brain tumor and epilepsy surgery. This is not a new technique. It was pioneered at the end of the 19th century by Bartolo, but of course we are very much in debt to Walter Penfield, who uh, developed this field uh, uh, immensely in the years that he spent at the Neurological Institute in Montreal. Now, interestingly, the way that Penfield uh, used the technique that he used to stimulate the brain uh, is uh, exactly the same technique which is still used nowadays when it comes to cognitive mapping. So he was used his biphasic uh, 60 hertz uh, rate uh, stimulation, user, usually with a bipolar stimulus, uh, uh, sustained for three, four seconds. So when you use the painful technique, which is the typical bipolar stimulation that you use for, uh, to produce a speech arrest, you're stimulating the brain for a very long uh, time. Three, four seconds is a long time in your physiology. And then you can record other look at the visual muscle contraction or better to record the electromyographic response from the contralateral muscles. Um, as I said, this is still the gold standard when it comes to language and cognitive mapping. While if you are interested in motor mapping, there is no need now that technique, the so-called MEP short motor book potential short train technique became available. As you can see here, with this technique, you stimulate the brain for a much shorter time, just about 20 milliseconds altogether. And right after the end of this train, you can get a master response. So the MEP short train technique has several advantages when compared to the classical Penfield technique. First of all, decrease the risk of intraoperative seizures. It allows to not just to perform cortical and subcortical mapping, but also MEP monitoring. And there is now increasing evidence that is more successful for cortical mapping in younger children with, who are, still have an immature cortex and cortical spinal tract. And therefore, a, a painful technique has proved to be very successful in the past in this uh, uh, subgroup of patients. Um, Lorenzo Pello published a, a very nice review a few years ago, uh, looking at the uh, value of the high frequency, low frequency, so namely the uh, short train technique and painful technique. And his conclusion was that the high frequency, therefore the short train technique was uh, by far the best frequency paradigm to stimulate the motor system. Um, now, I would like just to focus on the fact that it's important also for neurosurgeons to be familiar with some of the basic principles of intraoperative neurophysiology, uh, because this knowledge is essential to take the correct decision intraoperatively. So there are a number of variables that can affect uh, the way we stimulate the brain, the pulse duration, the current intensity, the number of pulses, the train duration, the frequency, bipolar versus monopolar, anodal versus cathodal. And all these can have uh, an impact on the success of your uh, stimulation. So for example, bipolar and monopolar just refers to the kind of probe you use to deliver the current. It has nothing to do with the parameter of stimulation. When you use a monopolar probe, you put a reference needle far away, and this is a less focal in stimulation which means that if you increase the intensity enough, you can activate other cortically or subcortically at some distance from the stimulating point. While when you use a bipolar stimulator, the current flows from one pole to the other, and therefore the stimulation is more focal. Now, some surgeons prefer to use monopolar, which is my personal choice. Some others prefer bipolar. The important point is that you are aware of what kind of stimulator you are using and the implication in terms of um, spreading of the current. So um, pain fill and short train have to do with the parameter of stimulation, bipolar and monopolar just with the, um, the probe that you use to deliver the current. But then traditionally bipolar has been associated to pain fill technique and monopolar to the short train. 
So um, sometimes um, keep in mind that if you stimulate the cortex, the current, especially if you're using a, a monopolar stimulation at high intensity, can spread across the soot side. So if the mapping results are tricky, you should open the sulcus and repeat the mapping. This is just a case. This was a young boy with a recurrent GBM. Uh, you can see here uh, the um, recurrent tumor and the cortex. Uh, so initially we stimulate without opening the sulcus. We got the same response uh, from the tumor from the primary, what we expect to be the primary motor is a response from the arm with 10 mm. And then, uh, uh, so this was called, of course, was uh, problematic because we didn't know what was what eloquent and what was not. So we opened the sulcus, uh, we put some um, gel foam uh, to uh, split the suit, the two gyri apart. And when we repeat the stimulation, there was no response from the tumor side and a clear response even with lower intensity from the tumor side. So just keep in mind that if you have an unclear mapping response, you may decide to open the sulcus and then recheck your cortical mapping. And then in the end, this is the subcortical mapping from the tongue and the hand with very low intensities. Um, another point, keep in mind that when you perform cortical stimulation, you should use anodal stimulation when you stimulate subcortically, it's like stimulating a peripheral nerve and you should use a cathodal stimulation. So for example, look what happens here. This is a cortical stimulation with 20 milliamp, a train of five stimuli. This is cortical, anodal, clear response from the facial and the extensor muscles. But as soon as we um, switch from anodal to cathodal, the response disappear. So these are little uh, details that may affect the result of the mapping. You should be aware of this to not be fooled by the response and results of the uh, neurophysiological uh, mapping procedure. So basically what we do, uh, we can use the phase reversal technique that Sonia was mentioning before to identify the central circles, but then we want first to map the cortical, uh, the um, motor cortex. Uh, so we use the short train technique, still a recording from the contralateral muscle. And you can see the uh, homunculus and define where the eloquent uh, motor areas are on the cortex, uh, like in this case. And then uh, um, once we have identified the eloquent cortex, we decide how to approach the tumor safely through the cortex. And then we start to work on the tumor. So while you are removing the tumor, now you want to make sure that you are not damaging the cortical spinal tract. So what you do, you do is you place an electrode on the motor cortex and you stimulate continuously to monitor now, not just to map, but to monitor continuously the functional integrity of the cortical spinal tract. So here, what you see is very similar to what you have seen in the slide before, but just, this is just a continuous monitoring. The previous one was a one at a time cortical mapping. Um, usually we uh, switch, the we rotate the electron 90 degrees from the phase reversal to the continuous monitoring because in this way you can stimulate from different electrode and possibly cover for different muscle groups uh, from the upper and lower extremity in the phase. Now, one problem is that uh, you can evoke motor evoke potential cortically or trans problem is that you may use very high intensity, which bypass the point of uh, um, surgery. So theoretically, if you have an insular tumor and you have a vascular injury at the level of the corona radiata, uh, but you're activating uh, the cortical spinal tract distally to that point, you may have a false negative results. So we always recommend to use cortical stimulation because in this way, you keep the current much lower. So the, the activation of the fiber is much more superficial and you can now monitor the entire pathways correctly. Transcranial stimulation exposed to the risk of distal activation and false negative, this can be risky. Like in this case, we, we were debulking a right frontotemporal high grade insular glioma. This is the continuous monitoring from the cortex this is the subcortical mapping near the internal capsula. 
Um, so at a certain point, we lost the potential from the cortical MEPs, uh, but we still had the potential from the transcranial uh, stimulation. Um, so this was an old case. We didn't have still much experience with that several years ago. At the end of the case, we lost response from the cortical MEPs while the transcranial MEPs were still present, but the patient woke up with a severe hemiparesis. So transcranial MEPs can expose to false negative results. It is useful sometimes to combine continuous monitoring with uh, uh, electrocorticography from the other electrodes, try to avoid after discharges and intraoperative seizures. Now, once you have removed most of the tumor, now you can use subcortical mapping to decide when to stop. So if the goal of cortical mapping is to decide a safe entry zone and the goal of monitoring is to keep uh, the integrity continuous during surgery, the role of subcortical mapping is to decide when to stop according to the subcortical functional boundaries. This was very well addressed in the previous lecture this afternoon. Um, and this, of course, is also when your uh, DTI and your navigation system can uh, uh, assist you, although most of the time when you get to this point of the surgery, the brain shift will prevent a valuable use of the tractography. Certainly, tractography and subcortical mapping can and should be used together. Now, how to stimulate subcortically? Uh, Andrea Cellini looked into this very carefully years ago, and there is now evidence that basically the short train technique in a monopolar fashion is still the most valuable uh, uh, technique to perform subcortical mapping. So monopolar short train for both cortical and subcortical mapping. Now, what is the correlation between subcortical mapping and the distance from the cortical spinal tract? So in other words, when you have a response with 3 milliamps, 5 milliamps, 10 milliamps, what does it mean in terms of distance from the cortical spinal tract? Well, there is now quite some evidence from different uh, papers that the, this correlation is considered to be pretty linear. So there is a, a rule of thumb of one milliamp equal to one millimeter, which means that you, if you have a response with five milliamps, you are more or less five millimeters away from the cortical spinal tract, 10 milliamps, 10 millimeter, one milliamp, one millimeter, and so far. But it has been Again, this should be taken with a grain of salt because, again, it depends on your physiological parameters. So that this correlation uh, changes quite substantially if you use different uh, stimulus duration. So, for example, 0.5 uh, is what you should use if you use shorter or longer duration. And if you use anodal instead of cathodal stimulation, the correlation changes uh, significantly. And so in this case, with a 0.3 millisecond in annular stimulation, you see that now 10 milliamp correspond not to 10 millimeters, but to five millimeters. So you might end up to be much closer than you expect to be in relation to the cortical spinal tract. So again, it's important to keep in mind the basic principles of neurophysiology to interpret the results correctly. See the difference between anodal, between the cathodal stimulation subcortically, very quite linear, the anodal one, the relationship changes substantially. Okay, so when should we stop with subcortical mapping? When is risky to proceed if we have a response? Now there is a quite uh, consistent uh, information across the literature that three milliamp is a significant cutoff for good versus bad outcome. So in other words, anytime you get a response with 3 milliamp or less, there is a significantly higher chance that you will have at least some transient motor deficit postoperatively. And this has been published by different authors, has been also our own experience here in Verona, which means that you should become very cautious anywhere before below 5 milliamp and of course, with their experience, then you we may try to be more uh, 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 brave and get down to three, two milliamp of, of uh, threshold. But I would uh, definitely recommend to be very cautious anywhere below five milliamp, which means that you are very close to the tract. 
Of course, you have always to keep in mind the neuro-oncological implication because more sensitive are your neurophysiological criteria. Uh, the higher is the risk of a suboptimal oncological result. What, what I mean by that is that if you stop too early, you may have no deficit, but you may leave some tumor behind. Of course, the more um, tumor, the lower is your threshold. And if you decide to go down to one or two million of threshold, you probably have removed most of the tumor, but of course, then the risk of neurological deficit is higher. So you have to compromise between these. Now we have technology which can help us to get to the edge. It's possible now to have a monopolar probe mounted on your suction device, uh, as was um, shown by Andreas Frabe a few years ago. So you can use the CUSA and the suction device with a continuous monopolar stimulation throughout the surgery to try to remove the, the tumor continuously without the need to stop and to perform um, subcortical mapping in a subcontinuous way. And it's also possible nowadays to have your monopolar stimulation mounted on the tip of the CUSA. So we can now perform subcortical mapping continuously. Now, a case just to summarize some of these uh, um, techniques. This was a, a young man with a um, Rolandic uh, uh, lesion. We perform uh, uh, a DTI pre Operatively, you can see how the cortical spinal tract embraces the tumor. These are the result of the navigated TMS central sulcus, and then we stimulate the hotspot uh, on the TMS uh, to found the cortical representation of the hand area. This is mapping of the cortex with two milliamp, seven milliamp. You see the activation of the different group muscles, and uh, and now down here you see the. Uh, the hotspot was exactly where the cortical spinal tract was uh, starting and when we had also the uh, navigated TMS uh, point of activation. So then the face reversal was done to select the best, uh, to confirm the best hotspot for continuous MEP monitoring. This was continuous monitoring from electron number four. And so we were removing the tumor while continuously monitoring from electron number four. And then we start to map subcortically and we stop when we got to 3 milliamp, uh, which was at the posterior, posterior inferior um, margin of the tumor. You can see here at the end of tumor removal, we map subcortically. This is the red spot, which was exactly on the cortical spinal tract down here. And this was the uh, picture at the end of the surgery and the uh, post-operative contrast CT scan. Um, what is a reasonable warning threshold for uh, MEP monitoring? In other words, when should we stop based on the MEPs? Uh, I think this is by uh, Gordon Euler still the, the, one of the best paper which address the relationship between MEPs and outcome. Uh, basically out of 100 patients with a permanent new paresis, most of them will uh, would have um, uh, present a irreversible loss of the MEPs. So complete loss of the MEPs is very bad prognostically, but about one third of the patient uh, can have irreversible loss even just with deterioration, but not complete loss of the MEPs. So how much is significant? Uh, different authors have suggested different threshold, but anywhere between 50 to 80% is considered a uh, significant drop in the MEP amplitude in brain tumor surgery. This is different from spinal cord tumor surgery. In brain tumor surgery, you have to be very cautious with this drop in the amplitude. And uh, a few patients can still have um, permanent deficit, even with reversible loss or irreverse or reversible deterioration. Uh, recently, we look into uh, some other, other data uh, uh, to try to understand if intraoperative MEP variation predict motor deficit in this, to the same extent in all cerebral areas, and if MEPs are always a reliable predictor of motor outcome. Um, we look at 150 patients operated in the last two years with neuromonitoring, looking at the MEP data, the outcome data, and just to give you the, the most important finding, um, 
we had 2.6% of severe motor deficit at uh, the follow-up, but about a third of the patient with mild and moderate deficit and no variation in the MPs at all, uh, which of course is problematic. Six of these had premotor lesion, and so these were most likely involving the SMA, but four of them had Rolandic lesion. Um, and this is important because it seems that like the SMA syndrome, uh, when it is extended to involving also the cingulate cortex and the pre-dorsal, premotor dorsal area can be less benign than the classical SMA syndrome, but also it seems that there are some area in the Rolandic cortex that are not uh, reflected necessarily by changes in the MEP. So this is open a new scenario for us, and there is also uh, current literature suggesting that the uh, uh, is more complex than we expect neurophysiologically wise. So MEPs are very valuable, but might not be enough to keep uh, and protect from motor deficit because there are other functions not strictly related just to the corticospinal tract that are relevant for the patient uh, post-operative function. So it seems that actually um, preservation of MEPs predict the absence of motor deficit in insulin parietal areas, but not always in Rolandic and promotor cortex. Um, and this is another uh, interesting uh, case we, were, we observed recently. This was a, a, a lady who arrived, arrived to surgery completely hemiplegic for this Rolandic uh, uh, lesion. Uh, she was hemiplegic at surgery. The lesion was uh, displaced in the cortical spinal tract posteriorly, but we decided to attempt monitoring regardless of the clinical picture. The um, lesion was right there near the cortical spinal tract, but surprise, surprisingly, we had a very good motor work potential intraoperatively. The lesions were removed. The MEP remained throughout the surgery. She was still hemiplegic right after surgery, but uh, in the uh, subsequent months, she um, recovered almost completely function. This is the post-operative tractography and this is the uh, navigated TMS of one year showing the positive MEPs from the motor cortex. So the take-home take message for us was that you should not give up from monitoring even when the patient has severe deficit preoperatively because in some of these patients, MEPs are still recordable and this is a very good prognostic sign if you can uh, preserve them during the surgery for recovery. So what should be a recommended strategy during a sleep brain tumor surgery motor areas? This is a very old paper we published uh, at the very beginning of our, our experience here in Verona, but this is still probably the first report uh, recommending the combined use of mapping Why should combine it to with information on the Functional impact accumulation to not get any information about what has arose. So, first, operating on an insular glioma, we know that. Subcortical mapping, mechanical injury. So the combination of these two techniques is very, very important. And uh, um, I will uh, skip some of these slides just to go quickly to uh, the last few slides. Um, so there is now strong evidence that this technique improved the outcome of the patient. This is a large meta-analysis published a few years ago by Mitch Berger, Jung Dufo, and others. And we now know that the application of uh, brain mapping techniques uh, uh, reduce the late severe neurological deficit, although sometimes it may increase the temporary deficit because we are now more aggressive also in the eloquent areas thanks to the support of neurophysiology. And we have also extended the indication for uh, um, uh, gross total removal in areas where 20 years ago we are not have attempt uh, tumor removal. 
So the goal of neurophysiology is to help the surgeon to take a calculated risk, which is, of course, quite different from being rash. And uh, uh, what are the future perspectives? Uh, just uh, two words about this. This is a fascinating paper published by some Spanish colleagues a couple of years ago. They use cortical mapping in eloquent areas and they showed that in a, in a few patients, they were forced to abandon the resection because of uh, um, the tumor involving eloquent uh, language and motor areas. So they did a subtotal resection and they implanted grids in this patient as we do in epilepsy surgery and perform a continuous, subcontinuous uh, um, cortical stimulation, basically inducing a, a sort of fake deficit which were induced by the stimulation uh, of, from the grids. At the same time, they were training the patient to compensate uh, for this deficit through basically physiotherapy. So uh, simulating the effect of an injury and uh, um, supporting the patient to compensate with physiotherapy in just a few weeks, they were basically able to um, uh, neuromodulate plasticity to the point that when they went back to mapping a few weeks later, they find out that some of the spots which were uh, eloquent on uh, the first surgery were not eloquent anymore at the second surgery because the cortical eloquent cortex was displaced elsewhere. Uh, so this is anecdotal, but opens a new field with the possibility to use neurophysiology also to neuromodulate cortical function, and this may help uh, open new perspective in the uh, surgery, especially of low-grade gliomas. And this is just uh, a paper we published recently, just to say that neurophysiology in the operating room is also a lot of fun. It's, first of all, very helpful for our patients, but also a unique opportunity for us as neuroscientists, and I strongly believe that neurosurgeons are, are indeed also neuroscientists. We have a beautiful opportunity to investigate the function of the uh, nervous system in vivo, in humans, in the operating room. And so um, with this, I would like to uh, thank all of you. Um, as has been uh, emphasized several times this afternoon, your monitoring is a matter of team, and I'm very much in debt to all these people in Verona, especially our neurophysiology team, for their invaluable support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francesco. That was a, a real masterclass. And I'm sure that our, our attendees benefited tremendously from the, the combined and shared wisdom of our, and experience of our speakers, despite the time constraints. So again, thank you very much to our faculty and attendees for sacrificing time on a Friday evening. We're gonna move along swiftly with the discussion. Now. I know Francesco needs to, needs to leave fairly soon as well. So I'm gonna hand over to one of my senior consultants, Dr. Asan Kimazui, who's got a very strong interest in neural monitoring, neuro oncology, and endoscopy. Uh, Mazui, you wanna unmute yourself? And you can handle the discussion. Uh, Yes. Okay. I see. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Parayachi, for the. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Parayachi, for the generous introduction. We, we will start now with the discussion. Thank you to the faculty for the uh, wonderful presentation, and thank you to. The delegates who have submitted uh, their questions that we will start with. And uh, uh, to the host, Prof. Parachi, and myself, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, to kickstart the discussion, uh, I will start uh, with a question for comments from uh, Professor Sala and Professor Parayachi. Uh, central to the discussion uh, is the usefulness of intraoperative mapping and, and intraoperative monitoring uh, to brain uh, tumor surgery. So I would like to get comments uh, from Professor Sala, Professor Parayachi, on the usefulness of intraoperative mapping and uh, monitoring uh, in brain surgery uh, in terms of the extent 
of surgical resection and a limitation of post-operative neurological deficits and get comments uh, from uh, Professor Thanks. Faraj and Professor Sala. Thanks, Dr. Mazu. Francesca, I'm going to hand that over to you. Yeah. Well, of course, I'm biased because <laughs> I'm a strong believer in your monitoring. Uh, but I think, you know, that there is no... Uh, I just quote one of the uh, best uh, systemic review that was published to support the value of, of monitoring and mapping. Uh, you know, there will always, there will always be the disbeliever. Uh, nothing we can do about it. And there's been a lot of discussion on the evidence base of neuromonitoring, spinal surgery. Um, you know, interestingly, if we look as a neurosurgeon, how much of our practice is based on evidence, uh, we reach class one and two uh, evidence in probably no more than 6% of what we do every single day in the operating room. Um, this was clearly shown by some review paper in neurosurgery. Uh, so the evidence we have for neurosurgery is in no way better than the evidence we have for neuromonitoring. And this applies also to uh, neuromonitoring and mapping brain tumor surgery. I think these techniques are, uh, are not perfect, of course. We cannot prevent every deficit, uh, but the use of cortical and subcortical mapping in uh, awake surgery and also for the most system in a sleep surgery, um, no, definitely they can help to respect uh, the functional areas in the, on the cortex subcortically to the point that some of the groups with the largest experience in low-grade glioma surgery, they are now saying that they not, don't look at the brain, that they don't look at the tumor, they look at the brain. So in other ways, they remove the tumor even behind the borders, because we know that we have infiltration in all the flare area. And even behind that, as long as there is no functional boundaries identified with subcortical mapping. This is, of course, an extreme, if you want, of the perspective. But it tells you how the functional information is more and more becoming essential in your surgery. And you cannot have functional information intraoperatively uh, uh, without neurophysiology. That's my, my, my perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Paraci will then take more questions through you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I see uh, there's a question from Jason. Maybe just ask him to ask the question himself. Jason, unmute yourself and ask. Uh, Jason, are you still there? You asked about the... I'm still here, Prof. Thank you very much for the opportunity. So with the uh, experience that I've had in theatre, at the same time as a surgical aspirator being used with uh, intraoperative monitoring, I just wanted to know, is there any way that the combined use of a surgical aspirator combined with intraoperative monitoring, does it affect any of the readings of the SEPs or the MEPs? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you... I mean, with the, with the uh, suction, with the aspirator, I would say no. I mean, there is no major problem. Sometimes you may have a problem with the CUSA because it may provide some artifacts. I don't have experience of using the CUSA with the stimulator. Uh, I have been using, uh, I'm still using the, the suction device, the aspirator with the monopolar um, tip. Um, but that works pretty well. And it has the advantage that you don't have to stop map, remove more, more tumor, map again, and then remove more tumor, because of course you may have a low threshold, you stop the mapping, you remove tumor, and then you end up into the tract. And then it's too late when you go back to map again. With this continuous subcortical mapping, you can spare time and also perform this in a safer way for the patient. So uh, with the suction device, I don't think there is any problem with the artifacts. You may have some with the cruiser. Thank you very much, Dr. Seller. Mazvi, maybe we could ask those wanting to ask questions just to use the raise their hand function. If I can, in the meantime, maybe just kick off with a question myself to uh, Professor Foots. So in, in Oxford, you've got a, a great concentration of experts on functional MRI scan. But outside of that uh, level of expertise, what do you think the role of fMRI is broadly in glioma surgery? 
So certainly there's, as um, with every technique, some context in which it is not always helpful, and that has been highlighted by Professor Sala. If there is potential for neurovascular uncoupling, then there becomes a little bit more ambiguity, particularly when the map is empty. But usually the context is that we use it to help select sometimes patients where we're not certain what the risks will be. Often this concerns language mapping in a left-handed patient where the lesion is in the right hemisphere. So here the context is even if you do have awake stimulation, subcortical stimulation and so forth, you're only mapping a small part that is exposed. Whereas with functional MRI, we can get the picture of the whole brain working together. In particular, for risk assessment, but also for monitoring as the last couple of slides that Professor Sala showed, there's this emerging role for monitoring how the brain adapts. And there's now work from Dufault's grab, from Mitch Berger's lab, as well as I think probably Sarubo, who published on the ability to go back and operate when you encountered a functional border the first time round. Now, you could just take your chances, wait some amount of time and do your awake surgery again, or you could resort to techniques, although not perfect, such as functional right, to help tell you what would be the appropriate timing to see whether plasticity may have occurred or not. That's what I would say is mainly the role. So risk assessment and monitoring more widespread whole brain system level remodeling. Okay, thanks, Nani. That, that's really useful. Um, are there any questions that you have sent to you, Dr. Masu? Uh, no, Prof. No further questions. Okay, maybe then just just one more. So this to um, Sonia Nunez and, uh, and and Francesco Sala. So those looking to some new young neurosurgeons looking to set up uh, an intraoperative neuromonitoring service. You know, what does the neurosurgeon need to be trained in basically, and what 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 does the neurophysiology setup ne uh, need? Sonia, maybe you want to kick that off for us, and then we we'll go on to Francesco after. Uh, um, okay. Can you hear me? Sorry, I think I clear stopped my video. So <laughs> we can hear you. Uh, okay, um, I'm speaking from a South African context. Um, so I, I see some of my neurosurgeons are online. So don't penalise me. <laughs> um, I, I think they need to be basically um, some fundamentals in, in like how Dr. Francesco is. Sala said, basic understanding of what it means when we, we say that this is what we're changing um, in the dipoles and in, in how we stimulate, um, particularly with the supertentorial stuff, um, bec because we tend to scare the neurosurgeons when we give them feedback. Um, and I think that's problematic when, we, when we're stimulating. Um, so I think, I think we, and that's no fault of the surgeons because it wasn't available in South Africa. So um, I think we should... Um, be able to give the surgeons more uh, courses uh, in terms of what it means, what it looks like, um, how we're doing it, um, so, so that they can feel more comfortable. Um, that, that's just was my experience. I, I don't know if the surgeons agree, but um, I know that um, with the surgeons that I worked with, we, we kind of went through that, and I think with time we felt comfortable, but that was just my experience. Francesco, so, so we know the only thing worse than no monitoring is, is bad monitoring. So just comments on that and, and how we do it safely. Yeah, just to comment very quickly. Well, first of all, uh, about what Professor Furtz just mentioned, I completely agree with her. I mean, um, I think the fMRI still has a role for exactly the same reason that she pointed out. I was just saying that uh, compared to probably 10, 15 years ago, uh, with the use of now navigated TMS uh, with more extensive intraoperative uh, uh, neurophysiology accessible uh, uh, DTI has probably become less prominent than it was in the past. And especially for the language, it will be problematic to decide uh, uh, just based on the fMRI. But of course, this continues to be a, a valuable technique. And I think that generally speaking, we should really use all that what the technology made, uh, makes available to us. Now about um, how to start. Um, the the take-home message that I would like to leave you with tonight is that neuromonitoring is not uh, simple. Um, anyone who would like to uh, uh, 
become uh, involved in, in this field should uh, consider to dedicate a certain amount of time. When I, I was trained in New York, uh, Professor Delitis, who uh, was the, leading, the, the leader of probably one of the, the main centers for training your monitoring, he was used to not accept any fellow for less than uh, two years. Then he cut it down to 18 months, but not below that, because he assumed that there was no possibility to train properly a person less, at least, I would say at least a year. Of course, it depends what, how you start with. I, I started from scratches. Uh, neurophysiology of neurophysiology technicians who already have some experience may need less time than that. But this is a difficult field which requires knowledges uh, because as long as everything is fine, there is no problem. But you have to have the knowledge to pick up the very one case where something is going wrong. And that requires a lot of experience. Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, neuromonitoring is also a big business. So there are more and more companies uh, providing your monitoring, providing uh, the machines and the professionals, but the professionals are not always so professionals. I uh, know maybe there are people trained for three months and then uh, sent to the hospital to monitoring cases. I think this is very dangerous. So whoever would like to take a career in your monitoring and should, should get a proper training fellowship in a center where it can be exposed to many cases for a long time and then once he or she feels comfortable start to monitoring uh, alone uh, because again for sure no monitoring is better than bad monitoring okay thanks so much francesco uh Mazu, you you're still there yes Paul. Got any, any okay. questions to you uh, there are no further questions. Um, so thank you to to the wonderful presentations. Okay, just maybe just one one other thing before we wrap up, Francesco. So you brought up this interesting point of clinical assessment and the role of monitoring in a hemiplegic patient, which is quite an interesting interesting thing. Would you would you extrapolate that to spines as well? So patients that are paraplegic, would you still recommend that they be monitored or not? <clears throat> um. Well, we did a study which was actually never published uh, years ago because I then gave up. We didn't have, we were used to seeing many more in spinal cord injury patients than we see now. But years ago, uh, we were monitoring patients who came in with an acute spinal cord injury. We were looking at the D-wave and we were trying to identify what is called a, the so-called um, KILED uh, end potential, which is a neurophysiological marker of complete interruption, functional interaction of the cortical spinal tract, which of course translated into permanent paraplegia. And some of these patients, uh, we had two, two patients who didn't have muscle MEPs and they were functionally paraplegic before the surgery because of an epidural hematoma. But this patient had a monitorable D-way or better, he, he had it didn't have a kill end potential. No muscle MEPs, but there was something on the D-wave. We removed the hematoma and the patient then recovered. So you now neurophysiology can still provide some neurophysiological markers uh, of clinical uh, picture that can be helpful. Of course, you know, if the patient, the problem is that when the patient is paraplegic, 99% of the time, you don't have anything to monitor because you don't have monitor potential in the spine. In the brain, uh, it's probably more complex. In this case, you know, we thought that probably was the edema, although the patient did improve with the, with the steroids. He was still hemiplegia before the surgery. But I decided to give a, a chance and try to monitor and map something intraoperatively with, with my surprise. We got beautiful MEPs and uh, we preserved the MEPs at the end of the surgery, but she woke up still hemiplegic and then started to recover. So monitoring uh, was still in a way very useful and also predictive of the outcome. So, you know, should we monitor all the patients who arrive to surgery with a complete deficit? I don't know really, I don't have enough data to support that. 
but sometimes anecdotal reports made it make the all difference in science. So you know, I think that based on one case, I would probably continue to do that if, for these patients. Could I add to that, that in Oxford, we've had a minimum of two patients who presented with severe hemiplegia or at least inability to move the hand or foot. We performed an awake surgery and as we were debulking, function was restored. So I would 100% second, we do not rule out an attempted surgery, even if the patient has almost no function at the start. Yeah. And on, on, on this, uh, the, the data I have, I show you very quickly, but now the observation that you can have a uh, long-term deficit, although some, most of the time not severe, but long-term deficit with preserved MEPs, uh, it speaks also for the opposite. So there is some motor function which is not reflected by the MEPs. And this motor function can be very relevant for the patient. So now I'm, I'm opening now the discussion with Hugh Dufault <laughs> that of course would <laughs> operate all patients awake also just to test the motor, motor system. It has good reason in a way. I don't think this is strictly uh, needed, uh, but there are some aspects of the motor system that we can probably assess only in a wake patient or with new neuromonitoring monitoring tools in the sleep setting. So Francesco, uh, I can't resist the temptation to ask you one, one more question. So as a rehabilitation tool, do you think uh, TMS has a role in stroke patients or TBI patients? It certainly appears to be useful. What are your thoughts? Oh, oh yeah. I think TMS will offer a lot of surprises in the years to come. You know, we have been using, I mean, this is already used by our neurology and physio and physiatrist colleagues in, uh, in rehabilitation. They use TMS in stroke patients. But uh, TMS can be now a fantastic tool to provide neuromodulation in a non-invasive way. I mean, the, the, the Spanish paper I mentioned, uh, it's one report, of course, and it's, of course, invasive because you have to leave a grid on the cortex for, for a few weeks, uh, which is not uh, free of complications and risks. But uh, if we can, uh, for example, do a, a repetitive stimulation in uh, low-grade glioma patients and see if this is going to result in, uh, uh, in uh, um, speeding up the plasticity and allowing in a short term to go back to the surgery and maybe remove more tumor. Um, I think you know, there are definitely new tools in, uh, in the future of these patients and, uh, and TMS is probably one of these. Thanks very much, uh, Francesco. Masri, are there, are there any other points that you, you wanted to make or can I wrap up? Yes, of course. Just to say that uh, uh, this uh, topic is of great importance to advancing brain tumor surgery and it allows the surgeon to, to be more aggressive, uh, but to be more comfortable in terms of uh, reducing the post-operative neurological deficits. Thank you, Prof, for this important uh, presentation. Thank you to the faculty members and also to the EO Africa. Thank, thanks very much, Dr. Mazu. I want to th are there any other comments from our faculty? Natalie, you, you okay? Any comments you want to make? No, I'm, I think it's all been um, covered perfectly. Okay, thanks very much. Now, Sonia, you, you want to make any comments before we close up? Uh, no, thank you. I'm, I'm good. Um, if anyone has any questions, otherwise I'm, I'm all right. Okay, Annika, any comments from your side? I just want to say, I think this is very interesting. Um, we're starting to get in more into ne neurosurgery now in Steve Buke Academic Hospital. Um, so, yeah, thank you for organizing this. Okay. I'm going to wrap up by thanking all our faculty. So, Dr. Masri, um, Annika van der Merwe, Sonia Nunez, uh, Professor Foods, and Professor Sala, thank you very much for a really wonderful, um, wonderful webinar.